Heavenly Father, we come before you, and it is a uh, tremendous privilege to know, Lord, that we can come to you and indeed lay our burdens down, that we can come to you, Father, um, as we are knowing that as we come to you in that way and lay down those things that are anxious, uh, cause anxiety, those things that cause uh, stress, as we confess our sins to you, Father, that you change us. That you are bigger than all the things that we wrestle with. And Father, we just praise you for that. Lord, we ask and pray that as we enter into a time of study in your word, that your spirit would take your word and speak to us so that we would leave here changed. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it is good to see you this morning and um, this Fiesta weekend we talked about last night. I guess you all are the ones who did not go Fiesta today, uh, right? You see you avoided all the... If you haven't been, there's, there, there are no crowds. It's a delightful, calm experience. Please go enjoy yourself next year. The exact opposite of that. <laughs> um, it's, I'm glad that you are here. Today's a special and a different service uh, in type in that uh, today we have the opportunity um, to celebrate as a church and to celebrate with a family, to celebrate with our deacons, um, just uh, someone who we believe God has called out to serve here as a deacon. And just a prelude before uh, next week's sermon. Next week, we're going to talk about all of us being saved to serve and what that might look like. And you're going to start seeing a list of all the things that we are praying and asking people to see where are you called to. God has everything that we need provided here and on Saturday nights. Some of us just don't know it yet, but I want you to start with this because I, I know when you heard deacon ordination, some of you thought, oh man, this doesn't apply to me. Oh yes, it does. I want you to start praying now because you're going to start getting the next four weeks this very big question, where are you called to serve? No one is called to serve everywhere, but all are called to serve out of your giftedness somewhere. Okay? So that being said, we're looking forward to not only some of the areas where we have needs, God taking care of that, but we are looking forward to seeing. And last night was really incredible, that Saturday group. I had some men who talked to me out in the hallway. They were so excited, and I thought, Deacon Ordination, and these guys were new, and they were so excited. Like, we're going to pray about where God wants us to serve. And I thought, wow. Now, if we spread that over to Sunday, can we do that? Yes. We do that. Be in good shape. All right? So let's all do that. Interesting. We'll start off. We all like to look at the early church in Acts, and we study the church in Acts, and we look at that and go, man, I want to be a part of a church like Acts. Because you have Pentecost, right? And you have Pentecost, and Pentecost breaks out. Thousands of people are saved. And you say, that was just perfect, man, and everything was just going smoothly. Oh, until chapter 6. There is no perfect church. So if you're looking for one, don't join it because as you've heard, you will mess it up because you're not perfect, okay? The church is a collection of imperfect people that God is working in and we are to build one another up, okay? So we see in Acts chapter 6, after this incredible period of Pentecost, trouble start. And believe it or not, it's grumbling and complaining. Can you imagine that happening in a church? Grumbling and complaining in the book of Acts? Acts chapter 6. Important to our conversation because this is how the idea of deacons comes along. The good news is, is this, which is I find so comforting. Our God is a God of order. Our God knows what his people need, and our God does and moves according to his own time frame to take care of the things that he wants done. So yes, the church was moving, the church had needs, the apostles are preaching as they are called to do, but man, things start to become very complicated. All sorts of needs are arising, and now 
the apostles are doing things that they shouldn't be doing in terms of taking on more than they were meant to. And God says, okay, I've, I've got a plan for this. Now, in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. So the, the apostles knew they had a very specific role. They were called to preach and to pray and to equip the saints and to proclaim the word of God. And they knew they could not do all that was required. I don't know how to tell you, this is Just so you'll know, you, you, when you're, if, you're, if you're going to be... Uh, uh, um, Faithful to the word. Let me just say that. You don't slap something together the day before. You don't do it in an hour. Typically it's about, believe it or not, just for a sermon, a message. Uh, it, you pray and you study and you prepare. It's about 20 to 22 hours. Okay? And, and that's by design because you... You, the word has to really go through, and you got to wrestle with the word, and you really, you don't just throw something together. The word of God is serious business, okay? So they knew that they could not start serving and doing all these other things, waiting on the table, so to speak, and faithfully do what they were called to do with praying in the, in the ministry of the word. So a solution came up. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer, to the ministry of the word, and what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Permanus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid hands on them. So the issue at hand here were the Hellenists. These are Greek-speaking Jewish converts. These were, uh, they began to com uh, complain because they felt that their widows were being neglected, and that the Jewish widows were getting preferential treatment. And so now you have this going on in the church. Imagine, right? <laughs> and so the apostles know that their role is to focus on praying and ministering the word, teaching and equipping, and they cannot do that primary duty and take care of this new issue in the church. So men were set aside for the very specific purpose of serving and of caring so that that would enable, uh, for those needs, that would enable the apostles to fulfill their role. Because here's the thing, and we're going to develop and flesh this out even more so next week. Every single believer in the life of a church has a role. Do, do, what, I don't think some of you heard that. <laughs> do, do you hear that? If you are saved, the Spirit of God lives within you, and He has given you gifts, and you are intended to serve not only as a missionary outside the four walls, but you are also meant to serve the body of Christ to help build up. Okay? That's all of us. No one's called to do everything. Please repeat that after me. Because that all too often happens in churches. It's like people say, oh, I don't want to do anything because I know if I do, I'll, I'll get stuck for forever. They asked me to teach something like for one week in a children's department, and I've been here for nine years. And I mean, I, that, that happens. So you hear the stories of that, and people freak out. And so they're like, don't raise your hand. And so on the way home, as you and your spouse talk, I want you to pray. Where are you gifted? Where are you possibly called to serve? Because over the next four weeks, I'm very eager to see what the Lord has for us. Okay? All right? All of us have a role. None of us has the role to do everything. Okay? And when everyone is doing a part in their role, we all get the benefit. We all get built up. And when you, with the 2080 rule, which thankfully it does not apply in our church, okay, I'm very thankful for that because I've been in context where that is a situation where 20% do 80% of everything. Our percentage is higher, but my goal is still, and my prayer is still, that we would be one of those very rare churches where it is at least 80%, okay? Everybody's got a role, Okay? So, if that is going on, guess what? A lot of ministry takes place. We all want ministry, but we need to be ministering. 
correct? Okay, anyway. So what happens is they organize around this way, and then the results are very clearly stated in verse 7. The word of God continued to increase. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So as they organized for ministry, and as people served out of their roles, and as they took care of this situation, the church advanced. One of the reasons churches won't advance is because a lot of churches get stuck here. Well, that's somebody else's job. No, all of us have a role, okay? So again, you're praying for what? Where am I to? I have heard more enthusiasm in a doctor's waiting office, okay? Where am I to serve? And where is the Lord? There you go, okay? I'm praying for you in all seriousness, very much so. This cannot be a consumer church. This is a serving church. It must be. Okay? So let's encourage each other in that. Now, what's interesting is that this thing we see with the apostles in the book of Acts is actually foreshadowed in the Old Testament. Again, God is always a God of order and organizing, and he knows that no one person or group of people is supposed to do everything. Exodus 18, the children of God have been delivered from slavery. God has done miracles for them. God has shown them things that few people in human history have seen. And guess what they start doing? Complaining, grumbling. You notice the uncommon theme here? Yeah, right? <laughs> the people of God sometimes are a little prone to grumbling. Complaining. Just so you'll know, if you were to look in the list in Paul's letters of those things that God says are highly offensive to him, you're like, yeah, I know, it's the adultery and witchcraft and, and all and the drunkenness. Guess what also shows up in these lists? Gossiping, grumbling, and complaining. Now, just a word on gossip, because this is something I say everywhere I go, because I hear this all over. So I'm guessing that we need to hear it too. I've heard this before. Well, it's not gossip because it's true. <laughs> ah, sorry. Gossip is talking about someone else, whether it's true or not, when they are not there in a non-edifying way. Okay? But that seems to be one particular sin we in the church, and by we in the church, I mean we American Christians, we kind of say, well, you know, we, we may look at Catholicism and say, well, they have all these different scales of sins, right? Well, that's just silly. We would never do that. Oh, yeah, we do. It's like, yeah, you talk about drunkenness and this, that, and the other. It's like, oh, those are the bad ones. But gossip, no, that's, that's okay. No, we're just sharing prayer concerns. And we're really good at that, right? <laughs> Brother, I just feel called to... I just feel led to tell you something that, uh, you know, and then it's gossip. Just pray for it. And then you add on, but we need to pray about it, right? It's like, no, no, no. You just gossip and then tacked on, we need to pray about this. That was gossip. So let's all say we need to understand a few things. One, gossip is not pleasing to God, and you cannot tack on. It's a prayer request to make it right. But I digress. So here we are back in Exodus. And listen to what happens. The next day Moses set to judge the people. He's going to hear their cases. And people stood around Moses from morning until evening. Well, that's quite a day. Listening to complaining all day long. Some of you think you have an interesting job? Imagine being Moses. Sun up, sit down. Yeah, complaining so far. A good 10 hours of it. I think I have plenty more to go. The line's really long. That's what's going on with Moses day after day after day. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me. And I, I decide between one person and another. And I, I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. 
You're not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for, this should sound a little familiar, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide for themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you, you'll be able to endure, and all this people also will go to their place in peace. In other words, everyone will be blessed if everyone bears their load. Okay? And so you see, even back then, that was foreshadowing what was going to be happening with deacons, what the church would need. So, yes, God calls different people to minister in different ways to the body as a whole. And today, we do look at specifically at deacons because we are ordaining a new deacon, and that is Kirk Grell. If you don't know Kirk, you need to get to, you need to get to know him. Kirk, you can just, because you'll, you're going to be seeing more of Kirk and his family in a second. Um, but this is a time in which we recognize that God has been working in their life, in Kirk's life, and it's been a joy uh, just from my perspective as pastor to see what the Lord's been doing and how he works there and how Kirk is such an encouragement um, and the deacon body to see how uh, he has been a deacon in training and he has been tested and um, just to see that, that that servant's heart in him. And so we're affirming that today. Um, the Spirit again has given various ministries and various callings and various gifts to various people all meant to build up a church, all meant to advance the kingdom of God. Now we see deacons referred to in the New Testament and they are vital to the church as both an office and a function because if you take away the deacons then you're going to have those who are in a preaching, teaching, uh, pastoral role in the same challenge, in the same mess that the apostles found themselves in in Acts chapter 6. Okay? The deacons serve a very important role and, and, and the primary function of a deacon is to serve, and that's where the word comes from, to serve. Serve. Deacons are called to specific ministries so the church can be healthy, allowing others to do the ministries that they are called to do. So again, that all are working together. And there are qualifications for deacons, and we're going to go over those very quickly. I want us to hear what Paul has to say to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, 8, to 8 through 12. What are those qualifications for a deacon? Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. Now, Paul identifies nine qualities, and when you hear nine, you might be thinking, this is going to be really long. No, we're going to go really quickly, okay? Um, nine qualifications for deacons in this passage. Now, I want to say this on the front end, because if you're paying attention, you might look at that and go, wow, uh, are you saying that Kirk is perfect? Because that looks like you're supposed to be perfect. Particularly the blameless part, right? There's a specific kind of Greek literature that this is borrowing from in which virtues would be listed. And in other words, that person was to possess these virtues and to be striving and growing in these virtues. But if you're going to be honest about the gospel, honest about everything the scripture teaches, there's not one person who could take a look at this entire thing, particularly the, for, the fact that the idea of blameless, okay, and say, oh yeah, I'm all of that. Well, no, so these are virtues that are to be a part of the person's life, and we'll, get, we'll break down these words, okay? We'll break down these qualifications, they are to be a part of the person's life, and they are to be growing in these areas. If these are not evident in a person's life, they're not qualified to be a deacon. Does that make sense? Okay. So, first, they are to be dignified. Now, this term in, uh, that is used here refers to one that is honorable, respectable, or esteemed, or worthy. Uh, it's 
the main idea being is that this person is to be a person who is respected uh, for who they are. In other words, they're, they're, char- they're a person of good character. Okay? Second, they are to not be double-tongued. Now, that's a really interesting thing in the Greek, and it actually can mean a couple of different things. A double-tongued person, first of all, is someone who might be a person that says one thing and then does another. Okay? So a deacon is not to be one who says, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm living this way, but they go out and live a completely different way. Or, or they do one, say one thing and then they do uh, another. But it can also mean that their words just are not trustworthy. That they will say whatever needs to be said to make someone happy or whatever. So they'll tell one person this, another person that, so on. So. In other words, a deacon is to be a person who, when they say something that you're to say, okay, I, 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 they said that, and so I, yeah, I, I can trust yeah, a person is a reliable person. They're an honorable person with their words. Okay? Third, they are not addicted to much wine. Now, there are a couple of things here I want us to focus on. A man is disqualified for the office of deacon if he is addicted to wine or strong drink because this person lacks self-control and is undisciplined. The emphasis here on the word, the first thing is addicted. Addiction in and of itself is an issue. Addiction to anything. Because we're not to be mastered by anything. Period. Except the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So the addiction is an issue. Addicted to much wine or strong drink, we know from Scripture that means the person lacks self-control because it's impossible to be filled with the Holy Spirit and drunk with wine. And so the whole idea here uh, that we're looking at is that the deacon is not to be addicted to strong drink. And and by that meaning that he's just, he's going to continually be filled with that as opposed to the Spirit. Fourth, they are not to be greedy for dishonest gain. There are a couple of things here. First of all, if a person is a lover of money, he's not qualified to be a deacon, particularly because often in churches, deacons will, as a part of their service, handle the finances of the church. So the emphasis here is on two things. One, greedy. Greed is idolatry, covetousness. as a love for money in which love for money is elevated above the love for the Lord. So if a person is greedy, they're not qualified to be a, a, a deacon, Okay. Not qualified to serve. Now, let me just say this because as, as I say all this, it just it hit me when I, when I was studying and I had to mention it last night. This is not to say if you're not a deacon that all these things are okay. All right? <laughs> oh, this is, you know, I'm not a deacon. Great. Let's go out and party and get greedy. Okay? That's not what it's saying. What this is saying is that for the deacon in particular, they really have to demonstrate these virtues. Does that make sense? Greed is also a lack of contentment. I want you to understand it that way. Contentment in Christ. Because when we're greedy and we have to have more, 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 we think we have to have more. That more will satisfy, right? That more will satisfy the deep longings in our soul. What that is saying is, in effect, is that Christ is not enough. For the Christian, Christ is everything. Okay? So they're not to be greedy, but they're also not to be someone who is greedy for dishonest gain. That means a person who is untrustworthy with their financial matters. They're willing to steal or to lie to get more. Dishonest gain is a, is a terrible thing. And the illustration that we would use, I had this conversation with some folks on Saturday night, which I found to be interesting because I've had this in churches everywhere where I've gone. And apparently, and I'm just going to guess this has happened to some of you too. You um, may have seen a business that had a fish on it and you thought, oh, here's a Christian. I can trust that person. It'll be great. And then you got burned. I know people who say when they see that, they will not go. Because some people use that as a means to say, hey, we're brothers and sisters. It's like, oh, hey, we're brothers and sisters, so you can rip me off? I mean, I don't, I don't get it. In other words, the deacon is to be someone that we can say is a person who is making an honest living. They're not ripping people off. They're not bringing a bad name on Christ or the church because of their dealings with money and or their business. Does that make sense? Okay. Fifth. They are to be sound in faith and life. That is in verse 9. They are to hold the mystery of the faith with a a clear conscience. Now, the phrase, the mystery of the faith, is is one of the ways that Paul refers to the gospel. And you can see that in 1 Timothy 3.16. So, therefore, this statement refers to something that's very important. The deacons need to hold firm to the gospel without wavering. Therefore, the deacon has to know the gospel, must know the truth. But this isn't just refer to just knowing it also holds means that you're to hold it with a clear conscience that is the behavior of the deacon is to be aligned with his beliefs 
You can know a great deal about God and not much of God. You can know a great deal about God and live like you don't. The deacon is not to be that. This refers to living in the grace that God provides out what you know. No one does this perfectly, but Scripture does teach we are all in process. But again, the literature type used here holds up the virtue of a deacon as one who is continually growing, as one who is integrating what he knows and how he lives. Six, here's the thing in verse 10 that helps us understand the literature type perhaps the best. They are to be blameless. There's not a person here, again, if you're honest, who would say, I'm blameless. You can't point at one thing in my life I do wrong now. I'm a Christian. No, this word in the Greek is actually very interesting. Um, it's a general broad term refers to, that refers to the person's overall character. Okay? So meaning that their character, it doesn't mean they're supposed to be, that, they're, that people are going to say that person is perfect. What they're going to say is, you know what, that's a person of good character. That person, that, that person has a good character. So that's what it's referring to there. It's pointing to the man being a man who is a virtuous man. And then Paul says that he is to be tested. And that's one of the things that has been a blessing is that we have a, a part for our, our deacons do where they, a deacon candidate goes through a, this deacon, a time of deacon testing and they, and they um, go through this process of just being a deacon in training. And, and Kirk has gone through that and shown himself faithful in that. He has learned. He has grown. It's been a joy to watch. And I will tell you this, not to, and, I, and I embarrassed him last night. I want to do it again. I, got to, I was talking with Bill Cummins, uh, who is a deacon emeritus uh, now, and he is in, uh, he's had some health issues. But he and I were talking, and um, he just said, oh, I wish I could be here today. Um, and, he, and he was bragging. He, and I said, you don't think you want me to tell Kirk? He said, yeah, I want you just to tell him that I, it's been a real joy to watch him grow over the past few years, and I'm just so proud of the job that he and Vicki have done with their family. And, and, and that, that's a blessing. And so to see growth, and that's, what, that's the joy when you stay in a place, folks. We get to watch each other grow. Just a real quick show of hands. How many of you have been blessed because you've seen someone else in the body grow and, and that's encouraged you. If you don't stick and plant yourself, you miss that. It's been a joy, Kirk, and I commend you all. It's been a pleasure to see the growth and to see how the Lord works in your life. The seventh, he is to have a godly wife. Now, this is where you're not going to go chase down this rabbit trail because it's debated in verse 11 whether this refers to a deacon's wife or to a deaconess. And that goes to a lady named Phoebe. That's a whole different conversation. Don't you send me your emails about today and want to debate. We have more important things to focus on right now, okay? But for the sake of this discussion and an entire other later on down the road, the discussion on who Phoebe was and what all that may or may not mean, Let's run with the normally accepted assumption that this is the qualification for a deacon's wife. Okay? According to Paul, deacon's wives must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded. And here you have something almost like blameless, faithful in all things. It's like, wow, man. Almost perfect. Good news, Vicki. God does not expect you to be perfect. Okay, this is another one of those broader terms when it says faithful in all things. It is the idea, it's not perfectionism, but it's teaching that the, that the deacon's wife is to be known as a, as a woman who is faithful. Okay, faithful in her service to her family, to her Lord and Savior. She must also be dignified, respectable. In other words, she should have a, a, a good character. She must not be a slanderer or a person who goes around spreading gossip. And again, church, does that mean if you're not a deacon's wife, that it's okay for her? No, right? Just a heads up, it really does displease God profoundly. So, so don't. Stop it. <laughs> don't do it if you're doing it, okay? Um, God's not pleased by that. And it says she must be faithful in all things. So again, that's a broad general statement, a requirement um, 
where you see like the, an elder is to be completely above reproach. Well, an elder is not always going to be perfect. Uh, or a deacon is to be blameless. Again, these are the same, it's, it's, it's the Greek style of literature that's being used here to point to these virtues. So the deacon's wife is to be considered a faithful person. Eight, let me go back now to the deacon. He is to be the husband of one wife. Now the best, this is the wording in the Greek and in this is, is, uh, has caused a lot of debate. Okay, you get different commentators and different linguists who are far smarter than I am, who argue this position, that position, so on and so forth. Uh, Mark Deaver, uh, who I, I think is, is, a, is a very good pastor theologian, uh, wrote that the best interpretation of this difficult phrase is to understand that it is referring to the faithfulness of a husband toward his wife. In other words, that he is a one-woman man. He's not to have other women on the side. Okay. In other words, he is devoted to his wife. Ninth, he must manage his children and household well. A deacon is to be the spiritual leader of his home. He is to be the spiritual leader of his children. And that is true, again, not just of deacons, men. Your first ministry is in the home. That's your first ministry. If you neglect that ministry for any other ministry elsewhere, the pause is, is intentional. Then you are getting it backwards. You start ministry at home. Okay? He is to minister in the home. He's to be the spiritual leader that God expects him to be. He's to take that ministry seriously. Yes, a deacon serves the church. That's your primary role as a deacon, as a servant. But if he serves the church and neglects the home, he's neglecting his first calling. You know one of the greatest reasons why there's such a high percentage of young people who, as soon as they get out of high school, leave the church? It's not the church. It's something that usually is not taken. It's not always. There are exceptions. There are, I know, many godly couples who have poured their lives into a child, and that child just rebelled. But a real common thing, because I was on campuses long enough to hear the stories over and over and over, and we went on a field trip. We took some students this week, heard the same things again. If discipleship doesn't take place in the home and you just bring them to the church and say, here, just do that, you do the discipleship thing. That's a prescription for disaster. It starts in the home, okay? So when we look at the deacon, the deacon is to be one who serves for the glory of God the building up of the church, the advancement of the kingdom, so that others may serve out of their roles. The church takes that really seriously, and so our church, I've been very blessed, uh, has not rushed into just like saying, hey, we're in a hurry up and get a deacons. We, we've not done that. It's been a prayerful matter of understanding. We want God to raise people up, and we don't want to lay hands too quickly on because it's a big deal, okay? It's the day we get to celebrate as a church. And it's a holy time. And so today we don't have a typical invitation as we might normally have. So just, I will say this before we lay hands on Kirk, and, and, that's, and that's in a good way. If you don't know what that if I just realized I use insider language, and if you're visiting, you might be going, what do you mean lay hands on this guy? So we're not, no violence. So what, what I mean is, is that we're going to pray over, okay? He and his family, and there will be a, that time. So if you are here today, and let's say that you have a decision that you need to make or you're wrestling with, that you want to, to, to pray and to talk through, I, I just want to ask you to please do something. You can drop an email. Okay, pastor at stonebridgesa.com or in the bulletin you can fill out just that card on the way out. You can give it to one of the, the people uh, by the door, one of our ushers. 
that will uh, be given to me or you can go to the first the table, the welcome desk, and you can just sign uh, your name there and you'll be followed up and we'll set a time to meet, whether it's to join the church, to know more about what it means to, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Or if you've been praying about where you're supposed to serve, if you have a sense of like, yeah, you know, I've been kind of interested in, we want to hear about that, okay?